No, you were excited to get back on Sunday nights and yes, and to preach more and allow me to the opportunity to do it. I, I'm thankful for that. And uh, am I allowed to use this? Sure. Or, yeah, I <laughs> drank out of it though. That's I'd, rather, times, yeah. I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. No, that's sure. all right. Yeah, I'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> How you start, how you start out, is important. You want to get off on a, on the right foot, whether it's the preaching a sermon, or your first day of school, your first day on a job, when you first meet someone. How you begin is important, and you want to start off, as the saying goes, on the right foot. You want to get going and headed in the right direction. So. I thought we'd look tonight at some scripture, Matthew 4, 12 through 17, and um, it's some scripture that is very impactful to me in understanding the gospel, and I thought it would be um, great to preach on that since it meant, meant a lot to me and, and helped me to understand uh, the gospel. So let's read um, Matthew 4. 12 through 17. And this is when Jesus begins to preach. Jesus begins to, to preach. We're going to see three things about Jesus' preaching here in these verses. We're going to see his motive, why he started preaching. We're going to see his movement, where he went to preach. And we're going to see his message, most importantly, what he preached. So let's read 12 through 17 together. Matthew 4. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. He came preaching. In chapter 3 of Matthew, one chapter earlier, we see that John the Baptist has already been preaching. And he's preparing the way for the Lord. So Jesus went from Galilee down to the Jordan to be baptized of John. At the beginning of chapter 4 then, we see Jesus being led by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted, where he resisted this temptation. So that's the first part of the book. Now it's entering into or transitioning into Jesus's public ministry. And this is the beginning of it. So why did Jesus begin preaching? Well, we can see his motive in verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. John had been put into prison for telling King Herod that he should not have his brother's wife. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 13. This eventually led to John's execution. John had been silenced and put in prison. And the message that he was preaching was not being proclaimed. Jesus knew that the message must be communicated. So he began to preach. Notice John's message in chapter 3 probably one page back from where you're at. John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? We just read it. That's what Jesus was preaching. It's exactly the same message. See, the kingdom... And the message of the kingdom of God is not a divided message. There's one message. Amen. 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. Not one person preaching one thing, another preaching another thing. Like Jesus, what he was preaching is more important than what John was preaching. No. Jesus was validating what John was preaching by preaching it himself. Mm -hmm. It is not a divided or an unclear message. It was very clear. So this is why Jesus came preaching. Now, where did he come preaching? We see his movement in verses 13 through 16. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. He moved. He transitioned. He left his hometown of Nazareth, probably because they had tried to kill him. <laughs> he had said some things there in the synagogue that they did not like. You can read about that in Luke 4, 16 through 30. So he left his hometown because they rejected him there. And he came to Galilee. So there's the Sea of Galilee and then a town on the northern shore of that sea called Capernaum. It was an area that was heavily populated. And it's where he set up his home base and did his ministry out of. The, Capernaum was in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. In doing this, Jesus fulfilled a prophecy that was given in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus came preaching there, just like Isaiah said he would. Why was Galilee a dark area? Verse 16 said, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Why was Galilee a dark area? Well, Zebulun and Naphtali were in the northern part of Israel. The temple and Jerusalem and God's dwelling presence was in the southern part. So it was far away from Jerusalem. Not only was it far from Jerusalem, it was close to foreign countries. And those foreign people had come into the region with their foreign gods and influenced those people. So between all that, there was not much knowledge of God, the one true God. It was a spiritually dark area needing light. Mm -hmm. And a great light was coming. A great light was shining into the darkness. And Jesus himself is this great light. He came teaching and preaching. And when he did, it illuminated people's thinking. The light bulb went off, so to speak. The people heard Jesus' teaching and preaching, and many believed. Jesus is, in fact, the light of the world. Amen. John 8, 12, mm -hmm. he says that. So Jesus came moving from Nazareth to Capernaum. This is where he began preaching. So let's think now about verse 17 and really focus in on that. Before we look at his message, let's look at what he was doing. What was he doing? Read verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came preaching. The Greek word for preach is caruso. It means to herald or proclaim. Heralds were messengers that were sent by kings to deliver a message. The king would have something that he wanted to tell his kingdom. And so the king would communicate to the people by giving the herald a message and then the authority to go out and proclaim the message. Go to towns and say, Hear ye, hear ye. Loud, clear. They had a responsibility. They had authority from the king. That's what the word means. Mm -hmm. This is what Jesus was doing. 
He had authority from the king of all creation, God Almighty. And his message came with authority. We should listen to him. Amen. The people there, some of them listened. All should have listened because he came with authority. He came heralding a message from the king. He came preaching. Now about the message itself, what was it? Well, it's a summary. He didn't just say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the king over and over. It was a summary of what he said to the people. So he would teach them a little more specifically. But repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand is the message that he was communicating. So let's understand the words of that message before we get into what the message was communicating. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now repent. The Greek word is matanoeo. Repent. It's an important word. It means, it can mean a couple things. You've probably heard it explained before. It means to change your mind with abhorrence or disgust about sin. To repent means to change your mind with disgust about sin. Or it can mean a turning. A turning with contrition. From sin to God. So it asks the question. If it's a changing of our mind. About sin. What do we need to change our mind about? Well basically. Sin is worse than we think it is. Amen. It deserves the death. This is what the Bible says. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. Does sin deserve death? That's what God says. Here's how I think of it. Who gave you life? God. So there's a God who gave you life and gave you a conscience about what's right and has shown you in your word, in his word, what's right. When you turn away from the God who gave you life, you get the opposite of life. What is the opposite of life? Death. Death. So when you reject God and we choose sin, we are choosing death and turning away from life. So why is the penalty for sin death? Because you're turning away from God who gives life. <coughs> God sees sin as vile and disgusting he hates it he cannot tolerate it and his judgment is coming his wrath is coming on sinners we must see our sin as god sees it when we see god as holy 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 and perfect in every way and we see sin as vile and disgusting and against him and wicked and evil. That's how we need to change our mind about sin. Mm -hmm. When we agree with God that our sin is disgusting and evil, that it does deserve punishment and death, mm -hmm. then we will turn, won't we? Death, <clears throat> wickedness, evil, disgusting thing, turn away from it <clears throat> when we see it as God says it and describes it. This is repentance. When you turn away from sin, this is repentance and the way to salvation. It's the prerequisite for entering into the kingdom of God and Jesus calls us to it. He tells us, repent. God doesn't tolerate our sin. Amen. Neither should we. But we do. We think it's not that big of a deal. But it is. God says it is. 
When we treat our sin lightly, we're doing it to our own destruction. May the Lord have mercy on us. The next phrase tells us why we should repent. It's because the kingdom of heaven is at hand or near. So what the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. What does this phrase mean? Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. Other authors use kingdom of God. It means basically the same thing. Matthew did not use kingdom of God because he had reverence and the Jewish people have reverence for the name of God. So they didn't even speak his name as it being so holy. They saw it as holy, so wouldn't even speak it. And so Matthew writes kingdom of heaven, but it's synonymous with kingdom of God and they're used interchangeably. The kingdom of God. Jesus spoke more about the kingdom of God than about any other subject. It's obviously important. We should understand it. What does it mean? And what does it mean that it was near? It's a good question. First of all, God has a kingdom. Understand that. Flip over to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And we will read verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. His kingdom is a majestic kingdom. Many of you all just saying about that. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, yeah. not temporary. <laughs> so God has a kingdom where he is king and rules. It's full of those who truly recognize him as king, not just in word, but in how they live. So if we go back to Genesis to understand this. We see God in Genesis 1 creating a good world. Mm -hmm. What does he do? He calls it good. It is good. He made it. He spoke it into existence, which shows he has authority. Mm -hmm. He has power. He speaks it into existence and calls it good. Then he creates humans and he gives them the task of ruling and having dominion over his creation. Let's read Genesis 1.28. Genesis 1.28 says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God creates a good world. He has all authority. He takes some of his authority and gives it to humans to rule the earth. And then what we see is a problem. Because humans take that authority, and in Genesis chapter 3, they rebel against God. They rebel against God, rejecting his rightful authority. And so humans, from then on, suffer the consequences of their rebellion and are put out of the kingdom. God has a kingdom, but the humans are put out of it. But even then, God has a plan, a plan to restore his rule over his creation. Chris mentioned it this morning. God was going to restore his rule and put down evil. This is the story of the Bible. It begins in the garden with Adam and Eve's rebellion. It then transitions to Abraham's family, the nation of Israel. God chooses them. He's going to be their king. He's going to rule over them. But they want a human king. They rebel against God also. 
ultimately, God's kingdom finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Amen. So we see in verse 17 that God's kingdom is near. In fact, when Jesus came preaching it, it had actually arrived. Mm -hmm. He was bringing the kingdom. Jesus was the king. Mm -hmm. Revelation 19, 16, in retrospect looking back, says, He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Mm -hmm. He came proclaiming God's kingdom in this passage, preaching a message of turning from sin and to the one true king. He came preaching a message, turning, turn from sin, repent. God's kingdom is near. Only a fool would rebel against the rightful and eternal king of all creation. And that's me. I have rebelled against the rightful and eternal king of all creation. This is especially true because this rebellion leads to death. Just like we talked earlier, the penalty for sin is death. When God told Adam, on the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. My rebellion against the rightful king deserves death. Jesus came preaching, repent. We have all rebelled. Yes. We have all turned away from this rightful king. Mm -hmm. We have all rejected him in our own way. And we all need to repent. And we have hope. Mm -hmm. Because this king is not a king that is a normal king. Mm -hmm. This king is merciful. Mm -hmm. He is compassionate. And he is gracious. He provided a savior so that we might have a way back into the kingdom. Amen. This savior is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this way is trusting in his death. That he died the death that we deserve for our rebellion. He paid the price for my rebellion. Right. Mm -hmm. I deserve it. I should have taken it. He stepped in and took it for me. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God yes. that he is restoring his rule over his creation one person at a time in Jesus. Amen. When a person comes under the authority of Jesus, this is what's happening. A rebel who had sinned against the king who deserved death, is coming humbly back under the king. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is power. This is the gospel. This is the Lord being merciful in his kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your, your will be done. It's, my will is over. You are king. I tried being king for a while. It doesn't work. I can't do it. You are the rightful king. I come in submission. I come humbly. Do not think that the king will let you back into his kingdom because you tried to be a good person. Do not think that the king will let you back into his kingdom because you went to church. The king has provided a way for you to come back into the kingdom, but you must submit to it. Amen. The way that he has provided in his word, the way is repent of your sin. And it is trust in Jesus' death for the forgiveness of that sin. Yes. If you have not done that, if you are not doing that now, then you're not in God's kingdom and his wrath is on you for your rebellion. But if you have, you have God's promise that if you come humbly, that if you do repent, that you are welcomed back into the kingdom like the prodigal son was, Hallelujah. lovingly, 
fully, a full restoration. Then everything the king owns is ours mm -hmm. and promised to us. Yeah. Believe God's word. Thank you, Jesus. Do not think that there's another way back into God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. People try it, but God has prescribed it. It's what got us in trouble in the first place, is it not? Yeah. Not listening to what God said do. Rejecting the way that he said go. Do not you, do not do that again. Mm -hmm. Come under the authority of Jesus. Jesus came preaching this message of repentance to everyone. Mm -hmm. We cannot say that we are a follower of Jesus Christ. And not obey his call to repent. Mm -hmm. Are you taking your sin seriously? Do you daily think about your words and your actions and your attitudes mm -hmm. so that they might honor the king? Mm -hmm. Repent, Jesus said. Jesus Christ calls us to repentance. Many people try to trust Jesus without repenting no it's it's two sides of the same coin you turn from sin to jesus and he is your way back into the kingdom people who don't repent and trust jesus are fooling themselves thinking that they're in the kingdom when they have sin and refuse to deal with it or don't fully submit to the Lord Jesus. Jesus proclaimed this openly. Everyone needed to repent. Everyone. Everyone has rejected God by sinning against him. Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Romans 3 makes it very, very plain. There are no good people. There are no good subjects in the kingdom. Everybody has rebelled. People who have rebelled against the king need to repent. This is why repentance is a change of mind. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the seriousness of our crimes. Mm -hmm. When we understand the seriousness of our crimes and the seriousness of our punishment and the surety of it, yeah. then that grace that the king shows transforms us. Mm -hmm. Chris preached about Paul radically changed. Yep. That's what happens. I used to be king of my own life, but then I repented and turned to God and trusted Christ. And now he is king. Amen. When kings change, things change. Mm -hmm. When there's a new authority, everything's different. And so it is radically different. I used to be king, but now Jesus is. If we understand the wrath of the king is on us for what we have done, but he is merciful to those who call on him, then we are beginning to think correctly. Mm -hmm. When we truly repent and trust Jesus, we move from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. From death into a kingdom of life mm -hmm. and from sin to God. It is a radical change. There is a new king mm -hmm. and it is Jesus Christ. Amen. And we follow that king and we will not turn away from him. We will follow him wherever, whenever, and however. And just before he left earth, he said, all authority has been given to me on in heaven and on earth. And then he gave us a command, right? So our responsibility, our duty, and our privilege as people in the kingdom is to try to grow the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It is to make disciples. Mm -hmm. It is to tell this good news that there is a king who is merciful. It is to encourage people to repent and turn back to God. My challenge to you is this. <clears throat> Hear the voice of Jesus. He came preaching. 
what he preached. Well, this message that he came preaching all those years ago is relevant for us today. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Obey the Son of God and live with him as your king. Chris.